Hey everybody, and welcome to the new unit. We are talking about unit 5, which is about implicit memory. Now, last video was a very, very long video. We talked about explicit memory. We also talked about implicit memory in that video. If you haven't, for some reason, gone and, and watched uh, the unit 4 video, please do that before you tackle this one, because I feel like a lot of this stuff really benefits from kind of understanding the other side of things. Um, before we get there. So, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, let's see, let's just get into it. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is um, is implicit memory and amnesia and how we remember things without the use of language. We'll also be talking about a couple of other big ideas. Primarily, we'll be talking about priming which is something you see in cognitive psychology and social psychology uh, and clinical research. Um, we'll talk about how it's related to uh, implicit memory here. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Now, you know I like to start out with an example, so this is going to come up later in, the, in this uh, in this slide, uh, or sorry, in this presentation. Uh, so let's go through these words slowly. I'll go through them twice. So try to remember these because I'll, t I'll quiz you on them at the very end of uh, the, the, the unit video. Here we go. Forecast, scenario, variable, convince, mushroom, hardware, excavate, designer, momentum, misplace. And if you want to, you can use some of the tricks that I tried to teach you back in unit four when we were talking about explicit memory and all the retrieval cues. You do your best. I'll, do, I'll say it one more time. Forecast, scenario, variable, convince, mushroom, hardware, excavate, designer, momentum, and misplace. All right, here we go. So I'm going to start this this unit in maybe a little bit of a um, unpredictable way. Uh, and I wanted to start it here just to kind of show you the long reach of implicit memory. Now, just to kind of remind you, implicit memory is the memory system that we have for nonverbal things. Sometimes you hear it called non-declarative memory, sometimes you hear it called procedural memory. All of these are valid examples of implicit memory, but the idea uh, amongst all of them is that it's something about the way you feel or the way you perceive the world or the way that you move that reflects that you have learned something. And you can't always put it into words. My favorite example of this is tying your shoes. So for example, if I were to ask you to tie your shoes, could you do it? Absolutely, yes, you could do it. But if I ask you which, which uh, shoestring goes on top first whenever you are um, laying them over, there's a good chance that in order for you to answer that, or for you to answer which loop is created first and wrapped around the other, there's a good chance that in order for you to answer that, you're going to need to act it out, to use your hands to kind of simulate in, in the air. You know, here's what I would do. In that case, that is an example of implicit memory. And the reason why is because you can't easily put it into words. It's best for you to try to show it. And this goes back to something we talked about at the very beginning of the semester when we were talking about the difference between recognition and recall. So you may remember that recall is your ability to say what you remember, and uh, recognition is your ability to show what you've remembered. Um, all right, so here, this is the unexpected place that I wanted to start this video by talking about how you might see this in the real world without even really thinking about it. This is called the Kuleshov effect. If you take in um, intro to film here at Westfield, there's a good chance that you talked about this in one of your chapters. Uh, it's actually the first, this is actually where I learned about it, uh, the Kuleshov effect. And I remember learning about it and thinking like, wait a second, this is just priming. This is just implicit memory. So, um, I, so if, you, if you aren't a movie person, uh, you're going to watch a very quick 90 second video uh, from this guy right here. This guy is Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, he's kind of one of the most influential directors of all time. Uh, he directed Psycho and North by Northwest and The Birds and I don't know, uh, like a ton of movies. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I was going to try to name some more, but I'm kind of stuck. Dal M for Murder, Rope. Uh, Vertigo, of course, he directed Vertigo. Uh, he directed the original Rebecca that won uh, the, the Best Picture. Anyways, he's got lots of awards, but 
very influential as a director. But I think he knew something about how memory works, and he's going to explain it here for you. So, let the man speak. Here we go. Now, the third way is what one might call pure cinematics, the assembly of, of film, and how it can be changed to create a different now we have a close-up. Let me show what he sees. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees. And he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. He's okay, all right. I'm going to stop him right, right there for just one second because what we just saw seems very simple right that basically you saw a blank face then you saw another stimulus which was a woman in the park with her child and then you saw another stimulus which was that man smiling right and so we are meant just naturally when we see that play out in a movie we would assume that generally speaking and you may think that it's creepy now just because you know norms are different than they were back then but if your grandpa was looking out upon this yard and saw this and smiled, you would think, oh, that's just my grandpa. He just likes families. He likes kids. He's a nice old man, right? Um, it, so what's happening there? Uh, what's happening is that your memory for what happened just before, right? This guy looked, it seemed as if he was looking at this, uh, this park. Uh, when we cut back to his face, he's smiling. We associate that smile with him looking at those uh, that 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 uh, that mom and child. All right. Is sympathetic. Now, let's take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child, but leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in uh, a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks girl in a bikini, he smiles. What is he now? The dirty old man. He's no longer the benign gentleman who loves babies. That's, the, that's what film can do for you. Okay, and so just to reiterate what happened there, and the reason why I think that this is important to talk about memory, is that the faces of the old man, of Hitchcock, were the same for both trials. For the first trial where he's looking at, you know, this, this kid and, and, and the kid's mom, and then in the second trial where he's looking at uh, a woman that's sunbathing. Those faces are the same, but we attribute them to mean different things based on what came before. Whenever it was a family picnic, we associate that face as being a nice one, as being something that is cheery something that is maybe a little bit wistful, something that is a little bit sentimental. Whenever we see it in the second context, that same smile, the exact same stimulus, because it came uh, after uh, a different picture, we interpret that stimulus to be totally different. We interpret that stimulus then to be perversion, to be that this guy is, is a creep or something like that. All right, so, and if that doesn't click for you, if, the, if that doesn't quite make sense, revisit this one more time at the end of, of the, the lecture video, and I think maybe it'll make a little more sense. But this is just one of many examples of how you can see implicit memory hard at work without us really even uh, thinking about it, without us even being consciously aware of it. All right, so let's start by talking about Henry Mlaeson. And Henry Mlaeson, I've already talked about this semester, Henry Mlaeson is one of the most studied um, people in all of psychology. And so in the last unit, when I talked about him, just to remind you that whenever he was 27, uh, so right about your age or maybe even younger, uh, um, that basically he went in to have a uh, surgery to help his seizures because he had really bad epilepsy and the doctors removed his medial temporal lobes um, and as a result, he was unable to remember new things. He was unable to remember, create new memories. This is before doctors realized how important the hippocampus was. Otherwise, they wouldn't have removed it, right? But after his surgery, he was unable to create those memories. Now, we call this, in psychology now, we call it a lesion study. 
where basically um, a part of the brain has been altered and we can ab we're able to infer what that part of the brain does by seeing what impact it has on behavior. In this case, he was unable to create new memories and that meant to us, oh, the hippocampus must be really important for memory because we see what happens when it's removed. So Henry Malaisen is one is incredibly important figure in the history of psychology, not just for this and our understanding of memory, but also in our um, understanding of ethics, right? Because this is a guy who can't create new memories, and yet he was being tested on, right? Uh, and so can you provide consent to be tested upon if you can't remember, right? Uh, so very, very interesting um, and, and tragic in a lot of ways. Uh, and he lived for, for several decades. So that's why he's one of the, the, the most studied individual in all of psychology. This is an idea of where the hippocampus is. Uh, it is it's pretty small, all things considered, and it's kind of in the center, deep in the brain. Not exactly in where you would call the deep brain structures. This is generally referred to as midbrain. Um, so some of these important structures that help kind of power some very basic behaviors, um, but not anything like super primitive like... I don't know the pawns or the um, the medulla or or the the uh, the limbic system or whatever. Uh, all right, uh, so Malazan, whenever he had his or HM, whenever he had his hippocampus removed, he developed what we now call anterograde amnesia. And anterograde amnesia is the condition where you can't form new memories. So excuse me. <coughs> Oh, sorry, I had a big sneeze, and I'm surprised. Usually I have uh, a back-to-back, -back, buy one, get one free sneeze, but I guess not not this time. So, Malazan was unable to form new memories, and this was such a severe case that essentially he would forget um, uh, the plot of a TV show. If he's watching MASH in the 60s or whatever, uh, if he's watching MASH, uh, then whenever the commercial's on, by the time it gets back to... Regularly, ske regularly scheduled programming, he's already forgotten uh, what was happening in that show. He wouldn't remember what he was watching, but he also wouldn't remember what the story was of that episode. Um, and, uh, and if you think about when we talked about different systems of memory, that really lines up with the time course of short-term memory, right? That essentially he has sensory memory, he has short-term memory, but he's unable to take those short-term memories and consolidate them into long-term memory in a way that, we, that we're familiar with. If we were to give him a name or phone number, he would only be able to remember it as long as he was rehearsing it to himself out loud or, uh, or, or, um, or mentally. The moment he was interrupted, he would forget the name or forget the number that he was asked to remember. Uh, and he was perpetually kind of stuck in the day of his surgery that, he, you know, in his mind, he was always 27. Uh, and so to speak to some of the tragic parts of this, imagine thinking that you're 27. You wake up and you look in the mirror and you see somebody who is much older looking at you and you wonder, what happened to my life? I don't remember any of it, right? Um, he uh, had really hard time uh, with his parents passing because again for him he's 27 his parents are still around and so decades later after they had passed he had no ability to kind of understand that this is that this that his parents had passed away decades before most of his memories before his surgery though were left intact so in other words it's not that this profoundly affected his long-term memory in general it was just the ability for the hippocampus to store things from short term over to long term. So he still remembered his name, he remembered his parents' names and birthdays, he remembered his childhood home and all this other stuff. It's just that he couldn't create new memories. Now, the reason why, so HM is important for a lot of reasons, but one reason why is because he helped us understand um, the difference between explicit memory and implicit memory. And he did that with um, a researcher whose name is Brenda Milner. Um, you're taking this capstone, right, memory. I teach another capstone called the History of Psychology, and we talk about Brenda Milner a pretty good bit. She's a Canadian um, uh, uh, kind of neuropsychologist uh, who worked with HM for several, several years. Uh, and it was through her experiences with HM that she kind of realized that there are some things that he 
is able to learn. Some things he is able to create memories for is just that he has no conscious awareness of those memories. So let me give you a quick look. This is a, uh, if you click on uh, this link, it'll take you to uh, this um, uh, mirror tracing task right here. I highly recommend you try it out because it will show you how implicit memory works in real time uh, because you can feel yourself change at this. Uh, so I have this uh, as a five point star if I am uh, drawing this, right? Try to stay inside the lines. You go through with your mouse or whatever. All right, so I did it in nine seconds. And so I'm gonna try to do it again, but this time it's reversed. Oh boy, I'm so bad at this. Oh, this is embarrassing. Uh, so my, my controls are reversed. Uh, why am I so bad? I'm trying, I am, okay, I gave up. <laughs> All right, so whenever you're doing this, the first one, very easy to do, you know, for the for most po folks, it's very easy to do. The second one is very, very hard, but it gives you times whenever you complete it or whenever you give up like I did. After that, do it one more time. Do it just one more time, just, just, to, just to humor me, because I guarantee, now I'm not gonna put money on it, but I want to, I guarantee that if you do this two or three times, that second, the, the reverse one, sorry, the, this one right here where the controls are all reversed, uh, I guarantee you that your time is going to be even faster than it was the first or second time. Um, and that is the power of implicit memory. Because even though you can't consciously say how you've gotten better, you will find that you've gotten somewhat better. Like, I got a little bit better, but not really. <laughs> uh, and that's probably because I'm talking here to, with you, too. But this is the kind of task that H.M. got whenever he was working with Brenda Milner. Uh, and, and basically what they found is that H.M., his times got better at this task. In other words, his muscle memory got better and better and better as he practiced it. There's other stories about how whenever uh, some of the nurses that worked with him on the weekends, they'd take him outside for recreation and they would let him ride a bicycle. And he didn't know how to ride a bicycle before his surgery. Uh, and so he would tell them, I don't know how to ride a bike. I'm so sorry, but I can't ride a bike. I've never, I've never done that before, I don't know how. And they would say, just, just try it, just get on the bike and ride. And he would get on the bike and start riding and he'd be amazed. I can't believe I can ride a bike. This is the first time I've ever tried it and I'm a pro at it. But it's just that for a year, he had gone out every single weekend and practiced on it, but he had no memory of that whatsoever. He had no explicit memory, no conscious voluntary, voluntary recall of that, those memories. But he did have the implicit memory. He did have the procedural memory, that muscle memory for being able to hop on the bike and maintain balance and pedal forward to accelerate. Um, just like with the mirror tracing task. He had no conscious recall of actually doing it, but once you set him down, he got, he, he was, he, his times were very fast because he had all this experience of, of doing it over and over and over again and getting better at it. He just had no memory of it or no explicit memory of it, I should say. So HM is the first demonstration that memory is not just one singular thing. Instead, there are subsystems of it explicit memory versus implicit memory. And we talked last unit about how we can have explicit memory and then and then further we can have episodic memory and uh, declarative memory, right? So implicit memory is very much the same way where you can break it down further into procedural memory, uh, perceptual memory, and things like that. So not all memories are created equal. Some of them remained even without the hippocampus. In other words, the hippocampus is very, very important for memory but you can still have memory without it. It's just that it really helps consolidate explicit memories. Memories you can voluntarily, consciously recall and put into words. If you don't have your hippocampus, you can't really form or consolidate those memories. Um, all right, so HM still had a short-term memory. He still had a working memory, and we'll talk more about working memory and what that means in a uh, later unit. It just meant that without his hippocampus, he was unable to consolidate those memories. So he could encode memories. He couldn't consolidate them, and because of that, he wasn't able to retrieve them. Or 
Let me back up. He wasn't able to retrieve the explicit memories, but he could retrieve the implicit memories using recognition tasks instead of recall tasks. Um, all right, so um, let's let's move on. This guy right here, uh, he's kind of the the modern day HM. He's still alive, surprisingly. It would knock on wood. Um, as I record this, uh, he is still alive, but uh, I haven't actually haven't checked. I I checked right before I uh, put this together, but he was 85 at that point. Um, so he's still with us, uh, but he's not in good shape. Uh, Clive Waring is a man that, very similar to Henry Malaisen, had his hippocampus removed. Um, but his wasn't surgical. It was because he had a case of herpes and did not know about it. And uh, that herp herpes uh, complex virus um, uh, basically ate away his medial temporal lobe. Uh, and so his memory got worse until he was hospitalized. And at that point, it was too late. He had lost all of his memory. Or, excuse me, he lost his ability to create new memories. So if you want to see what Clive Waring would be like if he were still alive... We know, because there's a guy like that right now that we have lots of videos on. In this uh, video right here that I have in the, in, the, in the lecture notes, which I also have posted on Plato, I think it's an amazing uh, documentary worth looking at, especially, let me see, I would say the first five or seven minutes are absolutely essential, like really amazing stuff. Um, so, so check it out. Uh, you know, just watch the first couple of minutes of it and see what you think uh, about Clive wearing um, this band without a hippocampus. And you can even see over here that there's you know lots of uh, other videos about uh, about this guy. Um, all right. So if you, and in fact, if you watch this, and I show it to my cognitive psychology class a lot because what you see is as you can see, he's here in front of this piano. Uh, he's able to play music. He's able to play piano perfectly well. He's able to speak English, he's able to dress himself, he's able to walk around his home, but he has no memory whatsoever. Whenever you're having a conversation with him, by the time you are finishing a sentence, he's already forgotten the first things you said in that sentence. So it's very, very bad uh, short-term memory. At this point in his life, you're not going to see interviews with him when he's in his 80s, because at this point, that mixed with... All you know, with with uh, with dementia and cognitive impairment that comes with aging, he's just not in a good you know place to, to be videotaped and, and, and shared with. Um, so uh, here is an early uh, diary journal entry from Clive Waring. And actually, before I talk about this, I will say that it, this is a little bit hard to 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 deal with. It's it's hard to hear. So I'm just giving you a heads up about this. This is, a, this is an early journal entry of. Clive Waring says in 1990, around the time whenever he lost his uh, his explicit memory completely, and you can see him writing 7:46 a.m. I awake for the first conscious time, and then one minute later, this illness has been like death till now. All senses work, and then a little bit later, first thought: I love darling Deborah forever. That's very sweet. If you see the video, you'll see Deborah. Uh, and then, you know, four or five minutes later, first conscious stroll. So he's saying this is the first time I've ever been awake and walking around. And then at 8.07, I am totally perceptibly awake, first time. And he crosses it out because at 8.30, now I am really completely awake, first time. He crosses that out at 8.35 where he says, time to see relaxing TV. Okay, cool. He's got to watch TV. Uh, and then at 9.06... Now, I'm perceptibly, uh, overwhelmingly awake for the first time. And then at 9.34, now, I'm supremely, actually awake for the first time. And then now, 9.46, now, I'm awake for the first time. And then 9.54, now, I'm awake for the first time. He has a cup of coffee. And he said he wrote patience. And then at 10... Now I am awake for the first time. And you see that each of these times he's going through and he's striking these things out, especially the phrase first time, because it, as he's looking back at his notes, he's like, I have no memory of this. I don't remember this at all. I wasn't conscious. I wasn't genuinely awake, so he would cross it out. This just shows you that what, for him, that for him, his interrogative amnesia was so bad 
that he had forgotten a lot of conscious things before his accident as well. He was unable to consciously retrieve those long-term memories. And so what you have is for him repeating that it feels like every single moment is the first waking moment of his life that he can't remember anything beyond that. And he goes on to describe it in that documentary in great detail where he talks about it. it's, like, it's like death. It's like just pure void, pure emptiness in his life. There's nothing there when he remember, when he tries to remember. It's just space. It's just nothing. Um, and yeah, so, so really, really interesting, but really tragic and, and, and hard, to, uh, hard, hard, to, hard to think about. Hard to imagine. Um, all right, so uh, all right, let's let's move on a little bit. So after his surgery, like I mentioned, HM was able to show some evidence of memory acquisition, and these were confined to procedures and skills. So things like muscle memory or perceptual knowledge about how something works. He was able to learn to play backgammon and other kinds of games. Even though when you ask him, he would say, "I have no memory of that. I don't remember backgammon. I've never played backgammon in my life." Um, and we now know this as implicit memory, or sometimes referred to as non-declarative memory. And that's just any kind of memory that does not require consciousness for retrieval. Uh, so if you can show it, then usually that is an example of an implicit memory. If you can talk about it, that is probably going to be an explicit memory. And so this brings us back to our, our nice little flowchart right here, that what we're looking at in this unit and what we've been talking about are this is this stuff right here. And one of the things that makes this really hard to study is that implicit memory is revealed by indirect testing. With explicit memory, it's nice because I can just ask you these questions and you can tell me and boom, that's great. Now I know you have memory and I know you have evidence for these memories because you're able to tell me. But implicit memory is tricky because I can't rely on that. I can't just rely on you being able to tell me. And st because as a just by definition, you can't put this stuff into words. So I have to get clever. I have to find ways to indirectly test you on these things. And so I want you to be thinking about that whenever you're reading um, uh, one of the, uh, the, the article about amnesia um, in this, uh, this unit's uh, readings, that research article. Think about the test that they use and how indirect it is and why, and sometimes it's hard to understand because it's indirect. It's not as simple as just asking someone, hey, what words do you remember? Instead, you gotta be tricky, you gotta be clever, you gotta like time how quickly someone's able to, tr to trace something in the mirror, or how quickly someone is able to, to get on the bike and write it, um, that we're using that to infer about memory processes. So, so far we've talked a lot about procedural memory um, and we've even talked about perceptual learning too. So like learning uh, memory skills or learning how things look or how things sound, uh, learning what music sounds like or what speech sounds like, um, even if you can't put it into words, those are, you know, those are all implicit memory. But we haven't talked so much about priming or classical conditioning. We'll talk about priming later in this unit in just a few minutes. And then classical conditioning, we're gonna save for another unit completely. So, let's look at some of these indirect tests. Um, I'm going to give you a quick rundown. I want you to test yourself, though. So, are these implicit or explicit memories? And actually, I think that I may have gone over this. Yeah, I did go over this in the previous unit. So, um, knowing who the current president of the United States is, that is an explicit memory. You can tell me who it is, and that makes it explicit because you can put it into words. How to ride a bike is implicit because that's something that you would show, right? That's something that you wouldn't put into words. You would just show somebody how to ride it. If you were thinking about the first time you rode a bike, that would be explicit because you're recalling that, and specifically that would be an episodic memory, actually, which is a form of explicit memory. Writing something that you hear. So if you're just writing something and you're not really paying it too much attention to it, that could be implicit memory. If you're just writing without thinking about it, that would be implicit. But if you're writing something and you are doing it very deliberately, you're like, wait a second, how do you write an R? Or is it delib... Okay, that's how you write an R. Uh, oops. So that would be a case of implicit memory because I had to show you what the R looked like. 
Uh, playing an instrument, after years of practice, would be implicit memory. Playing an instrument for the very first or second time, that would be an explicit memory. Driving a car, if, it's, if you've been doing it for a while, is going to be an implicit memory. The Pledge of Allegiance, that is going to be an implicit memory as well, uh, because for most of you, you know it by heart. You don't even have to think about it. But if I asked you what is the second line of the Pledge of Allegiance, then you would need to slow down, stop, and think about it really hard and try to put it into 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 ver into words. Uh, whereas if you have it like that song, it's an ex it's an implicit memory, and you don't have to think about it. You can say that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Um, so, uh, what you had for breakfast this morning, that would be an explicit memory. Uh, all right. So, here's some new stuff. So, what does it mean for indirect testing? What does that look like for memory? Um, you can't just ask someone about implicit memory. You have to essentially trick them into demonstrating implicit memory because they can't tell you that they have an explicit memory. And if you recall, back in one of the first units, um, we talked about the difference between recall and recognition um, and how those are slightly different, but an, an important distinction. Here is where that comes into play. That recall is for explicit memory, recognition is for implicit memory. So let's look at an example. If I asked you to complete this word stem, could you do it? Could you look at this and tell me what the word is. I'm looking at it and mm, maybe not, right? I'm looking at this and I'm not sure what this word might be. Or maybe you might be able to, but it may take you a little bit. Okay, most folks in this condition, if they had an interrograde amnesia like Clive Waring or HM, they would say, I don't know. I don't know what this word is. And most controls are gonna do the same thing. Uh, most, most neurotypical folks, when they see this, they're gonna say, I don't know what this is. All right, now I'm gonna ask you to remember these images. So there are six here, and so according to George Miller, right, you should be able to remember uh, these. A stop sign, broccoli, a Yoohoo chocolate drink, um, uh, an elephant, a cat, and a car. So try to remember those things. All right, now I'm gonna get rid of those, and I want you to recall those things that you saw. So what did you see? Um, if you have interrogate amnesia, you would say, I don't know because they were in your short-term memory, you would be unable to consolidate those to long-term memory so that you could retrieve them. So you would say, I don't remember anything that I saw. I'm so sorry. The control subject, i.e. you, would say, I saw a cat, I saw a car, I saw a yoo chocolate drink, I saw an elephant, I saw a broccoli, and I saw a stop sign. All right, now if I were to give you this task again, there's a good chance that you would ace it because you're looking at this and a control subject would probably now see this and say, oh, this is the word broccoli, right? That's our good friend, broccoli, how nice. Someone with an interrogate amnesia would also say broccoli though. And that's the weird thing, that's the eerie thing, is that someone with interrogate amnesia would still get this right, just like you did. They would get this right and they would say it's broccoli, but, they would not be able to tell you how they know. Because for you, you would say like, oh yeah, it's broccoli, and I kind of remembered because I saw broccoli here, and that, that helped me kind of get there. That helped me kind of think about what it was. If interrogate amnesia would not remember that they even saw pictures of broccoli, right? And so that's what, that's what makes this implicit memory, that this is a previous stimulus influencing our behavior later on down the road without us being aware of it, which is implicit memory. This is also very similar to priming. So priming is where you have one stimulus in the past that is influencing a response to a later stimulus. Now, we talked early in the semester about the definition of memory, and we talked about how hard it really is to define what memory is because there's so many types of memory. There's so many different variations, and this is one of those really tricky examples because we don't normally think of this as being memory, uh, where, um, like in the Kuleshov effect with Hitchcock earlier, we don't necessarily think about interpreting that man's face as positive or negative as being something related to memory 
even though that's exactly what it is. If you look at this definition, where one stimulus is influencing your response at a later stimulus, that's exactly what you saw in that Hitchcock video. That is priming. That is something we deal with all the time in the world around us. But it is also a demonstration of implicit memory because we're not often aware of those processes. We're not often aware of what is influencing our behavior. And oftentimes, these effects can be very, very fast and happen with our awareness. And this key right here that they happen with our awareness, this is really what makes it implicit memory. But they, these effects can be very quick and they can last for a very brief amount of time too. So here is an example. If I asked you, my bad, I didn't mean to show you that. Uh, if I asked you to, to tell me about the words that I showed you at the beginning of class, could you do it? I'm willing to bet that most of you could maybe do two or three, maybe four, but that you wouldn't be able to do all of them. But if I then gave you the word stem completions and asked you to fill these out, where here you would say, you know, I'm, I'm so bad at this because I've already forgotten some of these too. I remember this is scenario. Um, I don't, ooh, this, I, I'm really bad at this actually. I remember this is if excavate. Hmm. <laughs> I'm really bad at this, y'all. I should have thought... This was... Oh, this is Mushroom. Ooh, what else do we got here? Um, VA. What did I put for VA? What did I put for... I don't remember. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and look. Um, one second here. Going back. To look. Oh, forecast, variable, convince, hardware, designer, momentum, misplace, all of these. But if you were like me and you saw those and you're like, wait a second, I do remember those, or these words came to you naturally, that would be an example of a word stem completion task. Why? Because you have those previous, because the way that you're normally supposed to do the word sim complete, and I should have backed up and I should have explained this a little bit more clearly, and I apologize for that. In a word sim completion task, generally what you're doing is you're just giving this to a participant and you're saying, just solve, just solve what this says. It can be anything, right? Uh, all right, so it's going to be forecast. Um, oh, I don't know. I'm going to put variable here. Uh, I'm going to put combination here. I'm going to put uh, uh, happy here. I'm going to put uh, delegation here. I'm going to put uh, motivation here, and, and so on and so forth. And you could pick any word, you know, that you wanted to, to be here. But if you chose mushroom, or you chose excavate, or you chose um, uh, scenario, it, it could be because you were exposed to those in a previous task where I asked you to try to remember them. And because of that, that previous exposure is influencing how you respond in a seemingly unrelated task like this. This maybe wasn't such a good uh, example because I, I tried to tell you to remember the ones that I showed you earlier, which would defeat the whole purpose because that would be explicit memory. But this is, the, is a commonly used example of an implicit memory because usually the words that are chosen here are not the most common. So for example, the most common stem with SC is going to be S-C-E-N-E, -E, is seen. Or for F-O, it would be F-O-U-R. The word for is much more common than forecast. Or for M-U, it's much more common for you to write music, but if you saw a mushroom before, then you might be more likely to write the word mushroom. Or here, for X, uh, you could, I don't know, you could put uh, exiled, right? Uh, which is a more commonly Use, well, I don't know if it is a more commonly used word than excavate, um, but uh, if that if you wrote excavate because you previously saw it in a, in a word of lists, then that would be an example of priming. But let me give you a couple of other examples here. Um, all right. Oh, let me, let me just back up. So, because uh, I tried to explain it using text here. So students that were shown this list are gonna be more likely to generate words that are also on that list. And students that were not shown that list are gonna be likely to generate words that are more common than the words you see here in the list. And that's an example of priming because it's your past experience that's influencing your present behavior. You'll also see this used in memory 
research and cognitive psychology research for what's called the Let School Decision Task. And the Let School Decision Task is a very easy task where you're just going to decide whether or not the strings or the letters that you see in front of you are words or are not words. So usually you have somebody with their finger on like, um, uh, uh, I don't know, like a Q for non-word and a P for word. They have the where your fingers are far enough away and you can respond as quickly as you can on your keyboard. Uh, and people are interested in accuracy and reaction time. How fast are people able to do this? So if I showed you the word doctor, you would say yes, that is a word. If I showed you this, you would say no. If I showed you this, you would say no, because these two are not words. Very, very easy task. And also, not related to memory, right? Because I didn't ask you to remember the word doctor. I didn't ask you to remember the word flunkerton. Um, it's just on your visual perception, how, and your your ability to to perceive language and words. How quickly can you assess whether or not these letters are a real word or are nonsense? And commonly, what happens here is that whenever there are words that are closely related, whenever they are related in some way. Uh, or if they are words that are used frequently in daily speech, that those words are going to have shorter reaction times, that you are going to have, uh, that people are going to be more likely to say, yes, that is a word, whenever it is a word that is familiar to them. Words that were previously shown are also going to have shorter reaction times. So even if it's a word that you don't use very much, like the word forecast, um, if you saw it previously in this task, you'd be more likely to say, yes, that is a word, if you saw it again. But don't take my word for it. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, this is exactly what you would see if you were doing the Let School Decision task, where you're, you're looking right here at the fixation cue, and then I would show you this word right here, and you would respond, no, right? Very good. If I show you this, you'd respond, yes, cool. Now you're going to have fast reaction times here because this is a commonly used word. And because of that, you're going to respond very quickly. What about this? Here, you're going to have fast reaction times too. And the reason for that is not because beagle is a common word, I guess unless you have a beagle at home, but it's because the word beagle was related to the previous word. And so that previous word, dog, is going to prime the word beagle. If you were to go through and do this task and, and you remove the word dog and you just went from planked to beagle, beagle would have a slower reaction time because the previous word was unrelated to it. What about this? This one is going to have a slower reaction time because it's an uncommon word even though I used it earlier today. But the word lesion is not used all that much in daily life so it's going to have a little bit slower reaction time than the more common ones. But here, the word surgical is related to the word lesion, and so the word surgical would benefit from that and have faster reaction times. This is not a word. That is not a word. But we would be very quick to say it is not a word because we saw it in a previous trial, so our reaction times here would be faster. And then finally, oh, sorry, I thought we had one more. Uh, and so what we, what we see there is that your ability to respond, or the speed and accuracy, is affected by your previous exposure to those words. So even if you can't say, here's why I, I re responded faster on surgical uh, than lesion, even if you can't put it into words for why you did that, that's why it's implicit memory. It's because it's a form of a nonverbal way that you remember and can recognize something without really being able to express it using words. So whenever something's being primed, you're going to have better accuracy and you're going to have faster reaction times too. We can also see that the meaning of words can prepare us for related, uh, for, uh, sorry, the meaning of words can prime us uh, for, for related words. Um, so if going back here, if I, you know, did the word, the, if the next word was nurse, then you'd be very fast at, at classifying that as a word because it is related to the word surgical. If the word was table, no, sorry, hold on, that's a common word. 
if the word was pantaloons, you'd be slower uh, at doing that because it's not a common word, and also it's not related to nurse or to surgical or to lesions. All right. So that's semantic priming, where we're looking at how the meaning of words can affect um, uh, uh, um, our response to them and how quickly and how accurately we can recall that information. Uh, all right, there's also associative priming. So it doesn't just have to be based on the frequency of occurrence or uh, the meaning of the word. It can also be these other kind of strange things. Uh, so this is an example of one of those strange things, which is um, uh, where you are uh, primed based on physical associations that you made. One of my favorite uh, examples of this is a very commonly cited one by John Barg. Uh, who is from Yale, I believe, at the time. In 2008, he published this uh, article called Experiencing Physical Warmth Promotes Interpersonal Warmth. And essentially what he found is... Or, and it, well, what he found is that the kind of coffee you hand somebody could affect how they treat you and how they perceive you. So if you were to participate in the study, what happens is you come up, you show up for the study, and while you're waiting, a stranger who is an accomplice of the researcher, they are somebody who's working for the researcher, sometimes they are called confederates, uh, that uh, stranger is going to ask you to hold either a hot coffee or an iced coffee. You don't know, though, that that's part of the experiment. You think it's just some random person asking you to hold things while they go to the restroom. Later on, in when you get past the waiting room, you're going to be asked about the individual in that waiting room, and you're going to be asked about your feelings towards them. And what they found is that the people who were given the hot coffee were referred to as generous or caring, these other kinds of words that we associate with warmth. And those that were handed the iced coffee were given uh, uh, descriptors like cold, indifferent, distant, um, uncaring, because they were associated with the lack of warmth, with this kind of chilly demeanor, which is really kind of strange, right? Like, because that coffee has absolutely nothing to do with their personalities. So how is this an example of priming? Because what we're seeing here is that uh, this previous stimulus is going to go on, or actually, let me circle this one up here, that this stimulus is going to go on to impact your behavior later down the road. Um, it's going to prime your, your, your feelings for that individual. Now, before I talk a little bit more, before I move on, um, I will say that a lot of this priming research uh, is kind of tricky because the effect sizes are usually very, very small. Uh, and sometimes those findings can't be replicated, which has gotten a lot of people in hot water uh, uh, about this kind of research. So for some of the stuff, if it's too good to be true and you're looking at it and you're like, I'm not so sure about this, you should try replicating it. Because like this study right here, this study has been replicated, but other stuff that John Bark has done that's been these kind of strange, interesting effects of priming have been really hard to replicate in the laboratory. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that before we kind of you know, moved on and, and went over. Um, so priming can be used also to help us understand things like stereotypes and prejudices. Um, and we call them biases, or you may have even heard of them referred to as implicit biases. And so uh, you might associate negative or positive aspects of something to total groups of people because of this, because of priming in this way, where your past association, you're unconsciously connecting here, usually because of stereotypes that you've seen in the past, or the way that groups of people have been discussed in textbooks or on the news or in books and literature and, and movies that can impact how we um, respond to them and how we um, uh, act. And so in this test, and I, uh, I put this on Plato too so that you, but you can try it too because I feel like people are always talking about implicit biases these days. It's kind of all the rage in research uh, um, to talk about implicit biases. Uh, and how you can get rid of implicit biases or, or what causes implicit biases. Um, so this, uh, this link can take you to a test that kind of shows you how that, is, how that is measured. And I would recommend taking it because even if you agree or disagree with it, it's just kind of an interesting kind of food for thought that you take it and then you have 
some kind of opinion about what those uh, results mean. Um, so in this test, you're meant to categorize stimuli as quickly as you can, and your reaction time is going to tell you about your inference about those groups of people. So this is the most common example, and this is the one that you're going to see on the news, for example. So uh, let's say that um, uh, one thing that was uh, that's that's been a problem for a long time is, uh, and you've probably seen people on social media talking about this. And I think the media has tried to do a decent job of counter counteracting this, but that whenever they would talk about like. Um, uh, somebody who, uh, and I'm going to talk about some really serious stuff for two minutes, okay? So just as a heads up that, and I'm not being, I'm not, I'm not trying to be political. You can call me out if, if you feel like I'm being overly political. I'm not trying to take any kind of side here. But that whenever the media is talking about black youths, for example, usually the, the photos that they use, especially if they are saying that, hey, this youth is, uh, we can't find him. He was last seen at this grocery store. We think he was involved in a robbery um, or that he was, uh, he was injured um, in line of fire or something like that. That the images that they would be likely to use are ones of like this young guy, like, you know, trying to look threatening or something like that. Some image they'd posted on, on social media. Um, and the idea behind the implicit bias is that because we see that in the media so much, because we see that the way that media covers people of color and black Americans is so different than other groups, that that might cause people to have an implicit bias against certain groups of people. This is the, this is the rationale behind implicit biases that you see here. So, in this task, if you were to take this task and you find that you have faster reaction times when you're categorizing people of color and guns, that speaks to an implicit bias you have for people of color and violence. Um, if you also have slower reaction times whenever you're categorizing white Americans with other violent iconography, then that would be an example of an implicit bias against that kind of stereotype. Um, so that is an example of, of an implicit bias. And as you can imagine, this gets very, very controversial. Lo lots of people have very loud opinions about this kind of thing. I'm just telling you what the research has found. And, and if you want to argue with the research, that's totally fine. Um, but no matter where you land on this issue about whether or not you think implicit biases are real or whether or not you think that they're exaggerated or that they are real and that they do have real-world impacts on us, I recommend that you try out, uh, you don't have to give any kind of, you don't have to give your information here, you don't, to, you don't even have to put in your, uh, your, your email or your name to be associated with this, you don't have to do any of that. Um, and actually, I'll pull it up for you real quick. I apologize that we're, we're, we're going a little long here. Um, but if you go to I wish to proceed, you can see there are lots of different uh, other forms of this. So like, for example, weight. Um, where people would associate fat with words like stupid or words like careless or lazy or clumsy. And uh, that's an example of an implicit bias against heavier people, right? Um, or if you uh, were wanted to look at, um, we can look at this for, for religions. You can look at this for, this is a, this is a really interesting one, uh, looking at gender and science. So do you associate scientific words more with masculine words or with feminine words because as you know you know there's a lot of people say that that stem science technology um, engineering and mathematics are male dominated and part of that is because of this implicit bias that when we think of an engineer the first thing that pops into our head is a guy for example um, so that is examples of, of stereotypes and how that can work into implicit memories. That these prior exposures um, of, of depictions in the media or in our daily lives might have influence uh, on these later behaviors. All right, real quickly, uh, let's wrap up some of the, the stuff that's going on in the brain. Uh, so what's going on in the brain for implicit memory one of the big uh players here is the basal ganglia the basal ganglia is a deep brain structure or uh, sorry it's more of like a mid-brain structure but 
on the deeper side of things. It's not like the prefrontal cortex where it's right there on the surface of the cortex. But uh, patients with Parkinson's disease usually are going to have uh, um, uh, really impaired basal ganglia. And what happens is that they, people with Parkinson's, have no problems at all with declarative memories, but they do have impairments in their abilities to do things like ride bikes, play instruments, write things. Um, so it's like it, it damages their ability to do skills, their ability to participate in procedures, to have muscle memory, for example. Um, all right. Uh, so this study, very interesting study, you'd never be able to do this on humans, this was done with rats, uh, and uh, you have this, what they call a radial arm maze. The maze is a maze in the loosest sense, where basically you're going to have some food at the end of some arms and no food at the end of others. And so, uh, in this task, there, um, and this is, I'm going to slow down a little bit here because I think this is a really cool design, and it speaks to how you have to be you have to test these things indirectly. So, in a declarative, in the declarative condition of this task, you're going to have food at every arm of this maze. So, it would be in your best interest to check out all of these different uh, hallways. You go down to the end, so that way you can get cheese. Um, for the procedural condition, you're only going to have cheese whenever you have a light on at the end of that hallway. So you're going to learn in the declarative condition when there are no lights, you're just going to go down to every every arm. Whenever you have some lights on, then you're going to go to the ones where those are there are lights, but you're not going to go to the empty ones. All right. Um, depending on where you have brain damage, either in the basal ganglia or the hippocampus, that can alter how you solve this task. All right, so if you are uh, doing this task and you have a hippocampal lesion, so if you have a hippocampal lesion, which means that you're unable to create conscious recall, you're going to have uh, a, a number of errors, as you can see here. Um, if you uh, um, have an error in your basal ganglia for the explicit task, no difference. Like it's it's super super easy. And this is just for and this data right here is for this right here for that maze. If over here we're now talking about um, uh, 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 that light is predicting the cheese, so the implicit condition of this task or the procedural condition of this task. Whenever the hippocampus is removed, and what we're looking at right here is, is the percentage of lights that you go to. So the higher here, the better here. Uh, here on the other one, the higher the worse, right? Because uh, we're looking at total amount of errors here. Here we're looking at essentially correct answers. And so what you're seeing is that um, uh, as the trials go on, that both the controls and the rats that had damage in their hippocampus both got better and both did really good. They knew to go to the light because that would be their cheese. Those rats that had the basal ganglia lesion, that had the basal ganglia removed, never learned. They would just basically go at random and never learn the light meant that there was cheese. Um, finally, oh, sorry, finally, um, the basal ganglia seems to be important in forming new implicit memories. Whenever the basal ganglia is damaged, you have an issue creating and consolidating those implicit memories, but it doesn't affect your, your explicit memories. Uh, but there's a lot of things that are unclear here because it's really hard to study this with humans. You can't just go into a human's brain and just voluntarily like mess with their hippocampus or their uh, basal ganglia. Finally, the, um, the cerebral cortex, I'm not going to talk too much about this right here, but what because we're going to talk a lot about it later in the semester when we talk about... Um, uh, when we talk about neuroplasticity, is that the area of cortical space dedicated in the brain uh, is a measurement of implicit memory. That basically, the better you get at a specific skill, the more of your brain is going to be dedicated to that skill. 
my favorite example, as we have right here, is for violinists. Uh, and I may have already uh, mentioned this example before because I talk about it in my cognitive class too. Um, but basically, violinists, if you look at their brain, you're going to find that their, uh, the, the part of the brain that represents their left and right hands are going to be different. There's going to be more uh, area for the left hand than for the right hand. But why is that? The reason why is because their left hand, which is processed in the right hemisphere, requires you have to have very precise, very coordinated left finger movements. Not, and for their right hand, you do have to do some complex strumming patterns, or maybe plucking patterns, but it's not as complex or as constantly moving as your left hand is. And so expert violinists, whenever they go into an MRI, they have more uh, ac they have more space in their brain and their cortex dedicated to this area because they use it more. So if you think about HM and Clive Waring, these guys that can't remember anything they do but still are able to learn nonverbal things, their brains are still changing. Their brains are changing even if they can't actually recall uh, any of that stuff um, uh, verbally or consciously or voluntarily. Uh, racquetball players have expanded uh, somatosensory representation in their racket hand and less in their back hand. Uh, I would assume that's, tr that's true for tennis players as well, but I don't think that's, that stuff has been studied. Um, and that this can be true for even as, uh, as short as seven days worth of training, that within seven days of training, you can see um, uh, changes in the brain take place um, from, from that uh, that training. And so to us, that's probably a good sign that this is where implicit memory takes place. So when you're talking about the hippocampus, the hippocampus is used to consolidate explicit memories. The basal ganglia seems to be for implicit memories. Help consolidate, help, help package them up, make sure that we uh, are able to learn skills and procedures and muscle memory. All right, and that's all that I want to talk about. Here's just some stuff about the cerebellum, but I don't think it, I mean, it's interesting, but I don't think it's as interesting, uh, and that's all that I have for you. So thank you so much for hanging in there, and I will see you later, but I do have, for those of you uh, who hung around, you know I like to show you something weird uh, or something personal. This is, and this is what I look like as a child, so now you know uh, that this is uh, me, at, I think like age three or four, I have no idea why I am screaming. I don't even look that sad, uh, but I was at the photographer and uh, whew, ha having a having a weird day, I guess. What do you think about those? What do you think about my fit, y'all? Uh, do you like my fit? You like my outfit? Is this stylish? I bet if I wore this to school, if a student wore this to school and I saw them in the classroom, I'd be like, "Yep, that tracks. This is this is the style today." Somebody hit jackpot at a thrift store or whatever and got some cotton red overalls. Uh, all right, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have a great, uh, uh, great day. See you later. Bye-bye.